James 2, hopefully that you are there. We are going to be digging into the first 13 verses. Um, But before we do, let's bow our heads before the Lord. Father God, nothing compares to you. Nothing compares to the love that is found in you, made known through Jesus, and now by faith living inside of us. Father God, I just ask today, as we open your word, as we sit in these 13 verses once again, having studied them through the week, having come from our small group discussions. God, would you just open up these verses to these women, Father, that we would see the heart of God behind them and that, Lord, you would transform us. Transform us by your love, conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Meet every single person, myself included, We are desperate for you, Lord. We need you. So would you, O Holy Spirit, meet every heart in this room, minister your love to us, and change us. God, I ask you now to hide me behind the cross of Jesus Christ, that these women would not see me here this morning, Father, that I would fade away, and that my voice as I speak, Father, would be from your heart and your heart alone what you have put on my heart to share, Father, in love, and in truth, and according to your word. May these women see Jesus. Go before us now this morning, we pray. Be our teacher, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I titled um, this message, What's Love Got to Do With It? Maybe when you hear those words, if you maybe are living in my generation, Yes, Tina Turner, right? The rock star Tina Turner back in the 80s. And as my two teenage, my two youngest, I have a sophomore and a senior who are my two youngest. As um, they have told me the 80s are back. (laughs) So all of you who think that your kids don't want to, you know, be like you, just think mom jeans. They actually do in 80s music. Um, So right, yeah, Tina Turner back in the 80s. What's love got to do with it? I'm certainly not going to sing the song because you certainly do not want me to. But um, yeah, as the chorus goes, what's love got to do with it? What's love but a secondhand emotion? What's love got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Sung by a woman who struggled in an abusive marriage, in the midst of all of her pain and brokenness, she dismissed love as a secondhand emotion a sweet old-fashioned notion. And her relationship, as she says, with her husband was nothing more than a carnal, fleshly attraction, even in the midst of the abuse. Her relationship with him had nothing to do with love. It can be dangerous ground when love is removed from a relationship or when a heart is so seared and broken, closed off, that love has no effect on how we treat others. Or even more, when our relationships become carnal or self-serving, instead of being based in the love of Jesus Christ and acted on from that love. As James will point out in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, love has everything to do with our faith and how we live our lives. So our stepping stone, as we've been giving these to you, we started with steadfast faith and then went on to teachable, and now I'm on love. So love is our stepping stone this week. James makes what I see in these verses three points about love. If you're a note taker, you notice there was no handout, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just going to do me. (laughs) Um, But there's going to be three points today that I am going to make from these verses, and then I'm going to end with a biblical illustration that hopefully will tie it all together for us. So let's start by just going through the first 13 verses. Chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. 
For if there come unto your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that, that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture... You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. And now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do, as those who, we, who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay, so as we start unraveling these 13 verses, and I'll preface this all by saying, that when I get into scripture and I start studying through it, whether it's writing Bible study or teaching a message, I'm always sitting there and you, know, you read the text and you read the text and I often print it out in many different translations um, that I'm confident in and we'll go, okay, Lord, what's, the, what's your heart behind what you're sharing here? Because we can look at this and we can go, got it, partiality, don't show partiality. I think you got that from the homework. But I'm sitting, I sit there with it and sometimes when Brenda and I are writing, uh, we'll be working through the questions and I'll look at it and I'll go, I'm not there yet. I, I, I got to just walk away. It's like digesting dinner. I, I got to just let it sit because I think we're missing something. And she sometimes will say the same to me. Not as often. <laughs> the beauty of the two gifts. And so I have to sit and she's known me well enough to know, okay, I'm just going to give her the time. So I had to sit with this for a long time and go, okay, Lord, what is the thrust? So when James starts out, and so the big umbrella is going to be love if you haven't gotten that already. So James starts out with a word of caution in verse one. And then we're going to see that he follows up his caution with a real life example in two to four. So his caution has to do with our faith and how it's reflected to others. He says, my brethren, again, he's speaking to an audience of believers, my brothers and sisters in the Lord. And he says, do not hold. Take note of that word. That word implies an involvement, the joining of two things together. So he says, don't hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is founded in, with partiality. In other words, don't let your faith mix with the outward expression of partiality towards people, whether it be through favoritism, prejudice, or discrimination, interchangeable words. At its root, I think we all could say in agreement that partiality is an outward expression of a form of hatred. James says, as he starts off, with his caution, there's no joining of faith and hatred. They are opposing forces, almost like two sides of a magnet. You know, when you used to try to put them together and you're like, hey, I can't do it. Yeah, there should be no mixing of faith and hatred. So my first slide and my first point is, there is no Christ-likeness in partiality. Talked between our faith and partiality in verse one, are the words, Lord of glory. If you read scripture fast, you might have missed it. I know I did on my first reading. And the Lord brought me back to those words, Lord of glory. And I sat back, I'm like, Lord, why are they there? Why couldn't you have just said the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ? Why did, we add, why did you add in the Lord of glory? So I dug into it, 
That word glory is doxa, which is referring to the Shekinah glory of Jehovah God. So get this with me, if you will. This kind of stuff excites me. Is that he's there inserting the Lord of glory, I believe as a reminder to us that everything that we do as believers is shining the Shekinah glory of God to all the people we come in contact with. If you know of the Shekinah glory all the way back to the Old Testament, it was the presence of the Lord. Sorry, I have a mint in my mouth. It was the presence of the Lord over the tabernacle. It was the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire that let the Israelites know, God saying to them, I'm with you. I'm with you. My glory is showing you that. And then Colossians 2, 9, in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the Shekinah glory of God dwelling in Jesus, Jesus the light of the world, shining God's glory, and now through faith, girls. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 tells us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Shekinah glory of God dwells in us and is to shine through to others. And James points out The glory of God shines through love, not hatred, impartiality. Um, I spend a lot of time on the Chesapeake. And a couple years ago, my husband and I, a dream of his was always to have a boat. And we took the plunge. And I was out there last weekend as we were taking the boat out of the water. And we were coming down the Chesapeake. And I was sitting in the front. And do you see that picture of just the sun glistening on the water? And as this message, you know, I'm sitting there, it was just he and I, and it's just permeating through me. And I took these pictures because I was thinking of that Shekinah glory. If you look at the picture without the sun in it on the other side, it's like these are diamonds that are just all over the waterway. And in the darkness of the water all around it, it's like though that's us, the shining of God and Jesus Christ into our lives. It's like we get to be that beautiful diamond shining in the darkness for God's glory. Such a picture for me of what he wants in our lives, what he desires, what he empowers us to be. And so James says, your faith in the Lord of glory should never show partiality toward other people. The two can't mix. Faith that shows love shines the glory of God. Faith that shows partiality would shine then what? The glory of self, as it elevates one person over another, as James will show us. Girls, nothing quenches the glory of God in our lives like the glory of self. Nothing quenches Christ-like love like selfish love. Even this morning, when I went to wake up my two teenagers, I've done this with all my kids, the ones who are out of the house, and I walk in, and I open the door, and I go, rise and shine, give God your glory. I said it this morning, I'm like, so true. May we rise up each morning and go, it's all for you, Jesus. My life, not the glory of self, your glory. So then James moves into verses two to four, and he gives us just a practical example. And he says, okay, so two people come into the assembly of believers. One is finely dressed, dripping with earthly riches, clearly a person of wealth and position. And then the other person, a poor man, we're told, in dirty clothes, maybe giving off a stench. And James says, you give the rich man the place of honor when they come in. He's important in society. You see his wealth. And then you give the poor man a place by the door. You stand there in the back. Or even worse, a seat at your feet. I think we can all imagine this scene today in our own churches, maybe in communities, workplaces, politics. Partiality, as James describes it, is permeating our culture, and it sets a man-made standard for elevating one person over another. It can be based on skin color, religion, a vaccine, a gender, and in this case, The one that James really gets to is wealth. James says we can be tempted to cater to the rich. Did you, when you read that, pause for a minute and ask yourself why? 
Is it just because they're dressed nicely? Is it because they do have a really, you know, um, a position or a status in the world we live? Do we elevate them somehow because we feel we gain something from them just by association with them? Somehow, when we show partiality to the wealthy or the rich or the ones that we have defined as somebody, somehow we get elevated maybe in our head to their worldly status. And then the poor and the dirty, the outcast, if you will, setting them aside. Because really, what do we gain from them? Maybe their stench is going to rub off on us. What is it that they have to offer us? Embarrassment? I don't know. But partiality sets them aside as somehow, according to a worldly standard, not a godly standard, as less than. Think of the first class seats on an airplane. By their very name, a person is elevated as first class, over others. My husband travels a lot for work. He gets what they call, on American Airlines, status. <laughs> One of the times we traveled together, we're walking onto the plane, they call for the first class people. My husband looks at me and goes, come on, that's us tonight. And I remember looking at him going, oh, we get first class seats. Really? Because I'll be honest, I've walked on planes, not that I travel a lot, but enough, and if you've traveled on the ones that have first class seats, you kind of walk by those in the front and you feel less than. Like, yeah, they're the privileged ones. They can afford those seats. Well, my husband gets these free upgrades, so if no one's sitting in those seats, American will say, you have status, and you may use your upgrade without paying for the seat. It was actually kind of disgusting. If you get to fly first class, no offense, but when I sat in that seat, it was like I automatically felt like I was somebody. And I think if we're honest, the evil and the sin within us all wants those first class seats. Anyone not want the first class seat? There's something in this world that says status, wealth, I'm going to set you apart because you get that first class seat. And behind that desire, behind the desire that was in my heart as I sat there and had to go, oh gosh, Lord, I'm sorry because this is yucky. The thing that you want is often the thing that he says it's not even good for you. Because the pride that came up in my heart, the feeling that I was somebody it's love based in emotion on a worldly standard and definition of worth. It's not the love found in God. Think about God for a moment. With David, the Lord said to Samuel, don't look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart as he looked at David. A heart after God's. 1 Samuel 16, 7, preaching to Cornelius' household, Cornelius, who was a Gentile, Peter opened his mouth and he said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality as he was being shown in that dream, the clean and the unclean, that with God, his heart is for everyone. No partiality, Acts 10, 34. So when we discriminate one person over another, or we actually parcel out love to people of our choosing, where is the reflection of God's love for the life he created? How is Christ's likeness seen? And then in verse four, James further says, when we do this, we become impartial judges with evil thoughts. That word partiality, diacrino, is the same word James used in, verse one, in chapter one, verse six, when he spoke of doubting faith. Same word. When we show partiality, we have a divided faith. A faith that separates, go back to that word hold, a faith that separates itself from the Lord of glory, elevating the things of this earth over the things of God, or worse yet, even God himself. 
We become judges, James said, and it's like we take these measuring sticks that were made in the world, that were formed in what the world said is valuable in a person, and we walk around with these measuring sticks and we judge people by worldly standards and selfish means. And we put ourselves in a place reserved for God alone, verse 9 says. James calls this out as sin and says we're convicted by the law as a sinner. I know I'm guilty of this. I believe we all are. And yet Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, girls, there's really only one class in the kingdom of God, and that's sinners. Sinners saved by grace. Because it's through faith in Jesus, we all can be first class citizens in his kingdom. It's level ground, girls, at the cross, and it should be level ground in our churches and among people. So now he goes into verses five through seven, and James gives us three questions that he digs at to get at the root of our faulty judgment. So my second point is, your love for God matters. So the three questions that he poses, one, this is in verse five, hasn't God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and kingdom heirs? Do you see the two, the, the dichotomy of the two things there, rich, poor, world, God's kingdom? Clearly presenting two different paths. Then he says, question two, like, don't the rich actually oppress you? That means exert control over you in some way with their wealth. And then question three, he says, don't the rich blaspheme the name of God to which you were called? In verse seven, don't they speak contemptuously of God and sacred things, devaluing God and disregarding him? And I think we could read this, and maybe you did, and you go, man, the wealthy are getting a really bad rap. Stacy's giving them a bad rap too. But I think we need to take note and see that it doesn't say God doesn't choose the rich of this world to also be rich in faith. You see, there is no partiality with God. We know that to be true. And yet we know, based on scripture, and maybe from your own life, that wealth can sometimes present an obstacle to full dependence on God. Jesus told us that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Money is the root of all evil, we are told in Matthew 24, 12. And in 1 Timothy 6.10, it can grab a hold of a person. It can be a motivator for selfish interests and cause our senses to grow dull to God. James has us considering how the wealthy can exalt themselves over others as well as God. And he cautions us with this example regarding our own partial treatment of people. But I want to look at the first question a little bit more closely in verse 5. What sets the poor of this world apart from the rich other than their bank accounts? I believe it's a heart condition. That it is often the poor, not only the poor in wealth, but the poor in spirit, as Jesus will often speak of, that recognize their needy condition. Having myself lived in poverty as a child, struggled financially in my early years of marriage, and now, by the grace of God, living a little bit more comfortable lifestyle. I have seen firsthand how wealth can breed self-sufficiency and pride. Somehow, when the bank account is meager, the soul is desperate for God's provision because you know, literally, your daily bread will not be there unless the Lord puts it there. Versus the wealth, or the wealthy, who go, Let's go to Target. Let's go buy what I need. Earthly riches often build the soul up to be deceived by a false sense of worth. And so when the poor learn of God's love towards them in their desperation, in their need, 
because it's not being satisfied in this world because they recognize their condition and ultimately that they're a sinner. How they receive the forgiveness through Jesus and they find a richness that satisfies and sustains them through faith. John wrote this in Revelation 3, 14 to 18. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich, I've become wealthy and I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold riches, refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with, set, with eye salve that you may see. That's the lukewarm church and the caution given in the end times. Man, hot or cold, I'd rather you be hot or cold. And you see, tucked in verse five is the key to our faith, and I believe the actions that follow. And what does it say? Those who love him. You see, it's those, that faith rooted in Jesus Christ, who love God, recognizing all he's done for our sinful condition, that we can't help but live in his love having received his love into our lives, having put on those white garments, having walked in the riches that we find only in him, love becomes the fruit of our faith through the Holy Spirit. John also said this, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. And in this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. It's not that we loved God, no girls, it's that he loved us first. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, beloved. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I find it interesting that our faith, I know over the years my faith has often been tested through my affections. Do I love the things of this world, wealth and status over my love for God? Or does my love for God influence my affections? In this case, does it cause us to love others with God's love as the standard? Because love for God is the great equalizer among people. It is our love for God that causes us to not only see ourselves in light of God's redemptive love and love his people as he does. Remember the mirror that Brenda talked about and James had in verse 1, 23 to 25. He says, looking into the perfect law of liberty. The law of liberty is the royal law we see in verse 8. It's the law of love that is found in Jesus, hence being perfect. Did you catch that? It's the law, the law of love, that governs everything else. Romans 13, 8 says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another, get this, has fulfilled the law. And this is what James addresses next. The last point as we finish out the chapter, our love for God affects our love for others. So I don't know about you, but I got into these verses, 8 through 13, and I got to the end, and it was kind of like a, huh? Lord, what are you saying? And I believe, and I hope you can hang with me on this, because I think this is a really cool nugget and it's going to hinge on where Brenda's going next week. But James gives the royal law of love as our standard. It's a royal law because it comes from the king to his people. It embraces the rich and poor alike. His law is not of this world or by its standard. It's kingdomly. It's royal. 
The royal law goes all the way back to what you may have heard called the Shema. It's actually called the Shema. In Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then in Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said, concerning the greatest command, the second is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two laws hang all the law and prophets. The whole word of, word of God hangs on those two commands. How is that possible? It's through Jesus. So James says in these verses, good for you if you love your neighbor as yourself. But you really don't because we know if we're honest, we are often partial with our love in some capacity. And he says by breaking one law of his law, and he gives two commandments, murder and adultery, he said you break them all. Because you see, the point he's making is you can't live up to the law and its standard by yourselves. We need Jesus, hence going all the way back to verse one, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the law, Galatians 3.24 tells us, was given to us as a taskmaster to bring us to Christ, showing that only God justifies our sin through Jesus None of our works. We can't live up to the standard in and of ourselves, no matter how hard you try. We can't muster up the love that is Christ without Christ and without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in us. Not even the best love you try to show others in your own strength won't win you a place in heaven. You see, the law doesn't save us, nor do our works. The law shows us we are sinners. We can't keep the law, and we sin against the law probably every day. But it was Jesus who by his perfect works and his complete obedience to the law, he fulfilled the moral law perfectly on our behalf. Matthew 5, 17 and Romans 8, 3. The law was our judge. Now the law of Christ shows us how to live like the one who gave his life for our salvation and freedom from sin. The law, going all the way back to the Mosaic law and the Ten Commandments, shows us how to live in the likeness of Christ, free from a sinful lifestyle, from worldly standards and selfish desire. Romans 8, 4. Galatians 5, 14 says that the whole law is summed up in one word. Guess what it is? One word. Love. Love is the law of Christ, the royal law, the law of liberty, the word of God. So the law shows us how to love like Christ through the Holy Spirit in us. And in this, God's Shekinah glory shines. So the Lord showed me something that I'm gonna pass on to you before I give you our last illustration that if you think of the Ten Commandments, they were given by God in love. The law of liberty, law of freedom, when he gave the Ten Commandments to the Israelites, it says in Exodus 20 that he had already delivered them from bondage. They were liberated. The law of liberty. It was given by God in love. It was perfectly obeyed and fulfilled by Christ in love, as scripture says. Not only sacrificially as the perfect lamb, no sacrifice is needed for sin, but morally, that he lived his life perfectly obeying the entire law in love. That Jesus set a living, breathing example for us to follow, to live in Christ's likeness in love. And then we're given the Holy Spirit after we receive him by faith so that we live in the spirit so that we actually can live the law out. Do you follow that? Okay, so watch this. If you take the, ten, oh, can you read that? If you take the 10 commandments, every one of those 10 commandments, and you replace it, you reword it to go, okay, 
Now, I'm not taking or adding or taking away from the gospel and from the word of God. It's like when you take 1 Corinthians 13 and where the word is love, you can insert Christ or you can insert God. This is, the, this is one book, girls. And so it goes all the way back to the law. Love has a single devotion in God. You shall have no other gods. Love holds no man-made substitutes for God. Love honors God's name with his words. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Love rests in God. Obey the Sabbath. Love brings honor to parents. Honor your father and mother. Love upholds life. Don't murder. Love satisfies all desire. Don't commit adultery. Don't want your neighbor's wife. Love is charitable. Love speaks truth. Love brings contentment. Oh no. I, when the Lord gave me that, I was like, wow. And because of Jesus Christ, who did the work, it's like we're saved by his works, not our own. Because he did it. He did it perfectly, and he did it completely. And so James ends by saying in verse 12 to 14, so speak and so do as those who will be judged your works by the law of liberty, love and mercy triumph before God. So I want to end with the story of the Good Samaritan found in Luke 10, 25 to 37. We're done with James. If you want to go there with me, I'm going to work through it quickly because I believe it takes all of the points of James' teaching and he brings it together for us. So this is what it says. And behold, a certain lawyer, a man of wealth and high standing, an expert in Mosaic law, he stood up and he tested, you see his heart motive, he tested Jesus saying, this is Luke 10, guys, sorry, 10, 25 to 37. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So we already know that this man, this lawyer of high position in society, an expert in Mosaic law, he knew of his sinful condition and he asked Jesus, thinking Jesus might have the answer. He said to him, verse 26, what's written in the law and what's your reading of it? In other words, how do you understand it? Verse 27, so he answered and he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, back to the Shema, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus 19, 18. So he quoted the law. And he said to him, You've answered rightly. Basically, good for you. You know the law. Now live it. Do this and you will live. Verse 29, but he, the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, again, we see his motive, justify his actions, the way he's living. It's the lawyer who would bring people into court, James 1, 6, or 2, 6, he knew he couldn't live out this very law that Jesus is pointing out to him. So he wanting to justify himself, and we all know only God justifies our sin through Jesus, said to Jesus, the very person who could justify him, and who is my neighbor? Is he looking for a way out of his sin? Just tell me who my neighbor is so that I can go, okay, I'm okay. I'm not doing that. Verse 30, then Jesus answered and said, a certain man, notice no status is given. A certain man, no status given by earthly standards, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest, hmm, a qualified man from the tribe of Levites. Priests were responsible for the temple and temple worship. And in Jesus' time, they held great power. So a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw this man in his destitute condition, he had no compassion or mercy. Mercy didn't triumph. His own will did. The hatred that he had and he passed by on the other side. Verse 32, likewise, a Levite. Again, another person. 
of a privileged office, office of the priesthood. When he arrived at the place, he didn't just pass by on the other side, he actually peered down and looked at the man, turned away, and passed by on the other side. But, verse 33, a certain Samaritan, a Samaritan in the time, half Jew, of bad reputation among the Jews, considered the lowest class of the lowest class. When Jesus passed through Samaria to meet the woman at the well, Jews didn't go through Samaria. You didn't even want to put your foot on Samarian ground. They were the low class people. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was and we saw him. He had compassion. He had mercy. He loved this man with no partiality because he saw someone in need. The outward didn't matter, but it was what drove him to the compassion of that individual. And so he went to him and he bandaged his wounds and he poured on oil and water and he set him on his own animal and he brought him to an inn and he took care of him. He loved him selflessly. And on the next day when he left, he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper and he said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? You see, it was the good Samaritan who went above and beyond in loving this man and showing him mercy. And then 37, he said, the lawyer, he who showed mercy on him. You see, the lawyer couldn't even give the credit to the good Samaritan by calling him a Samaritan. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So as we close... The admonition to all of us is, which example are we going to live by? Are we going to live in God's love and love with God's love given through Jesus? If there's been partiality in your heart towards another person, and maybe you've even tried to justify it, God's word is clear. That is, there's no partiality with God. There's no hatred, nor should there be in us. I encourage you before you leave to confess that sin before the Lord. Let him wash over you. Ask him for his heart to love whomever it is that you have loved with a partial love if you have. We're never going to be able to love others as James taught or Jesus taught us in Luke 10 without first receiving the love of Christ through salvation. If you've ever never done that, please see me. It's a simple prayer of faith, confessing your sin and asking Jesus into your heart to forgive you, to live in you, to make you new and empower you by his spirit. We're told he'll make us into a new creation. And then girls, it's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in us. And even that is the love of Christ given to us. And that none of what James is talking about. He doesn't give the theology. I just gave you a bit of theology. Next week, Brenda's going to give you the walk in it out. Faith without works is dead. But if we are not first rooting our faith in the love of God for us, demonstrated through Jesus Christ, then is your faith rooted in something else? Because it is by the empowering of the Holy Spirit and our faith in Jesus Christ that truly lets us walk out the law of love and love as Jesus taught us to love as he lived by his perfect sinless example. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to fall short of the glory of God. And then you confess your sins you go right back to the Lord, forgive me, Lord, help me to walk in your perfect, selfless love so that as I love others, as I extend my hand, it is really your hand being extended through me to all 
of the people I come in contact, that the love of Christ would shine through me and they would see the Shekinah glory of God Almighty in the love that I live and I give. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these ladies. Thank you for your example. Thank you that you loved us wretched sinners so much so that you sent your son Jesus to pay the price with his life for our lives and our sin. Help us. We are poor in spirit. And we know this world has nothing lasting to offer us. It is only you and the eternal glory that waits. Be with these ladies as they leave. Help each and every one of us, Lord, where we're struggling in a relationship or we're not showing love. For some reason, our heart has been seared. Oh God, would you help our situation so that we can love with your love and shine your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.